everybody. I'm Marianne Moenraj. I'm here with the Speculative Literature Foundation, and we're talking with Paolo Bacigalupi. Did I say that right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, Paolo is the author of The Wind-Up Girl, The Water Knife, Shipbreaker, a host of other books, um, and the winner of multiple awards. But we are here to talk specifically about message fiction. Um, it can be very challenging when you're writing around uh, different political issues. Uh, a lot of Paolo's work is ecologically centered, and mm -hmm. Um, being able to address the issues, some of which can be uh, quite dark, um, in a way that doesn't come off as a polemic, um, as a lecture, as a the way you might if you were writing a nonfiction piece. Yeah. So um, Paolo is hopefully going to help us see, like, what are some of the ways he's approached that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that um, the bulk of the work that I've done over the last, you know, 10 years has been uh, specifically around different sort of I guess you call it values fiction mm -hmm. is kind of the way I think about it. And it's, um, I've been interested in trying to illustrate, you know, what I think is important in the world. And one of the things that's really fascinating me about values fiction is how bad it tends to be mm -hmm. um, and how either basic, obvious, or didactic you come mm -hmm. off um, or, um, and so I feel like one of the one of the things I notice a lot when I'm talking to people who are writing values fiction is they're saying the man's keeping me down. Mm -hmm. They don't understand. Like they don't get me. They don't. Yeah. They don't see the problem with the world, or they don't. They don't take this seriously. And and almost always there's a moment where we put the the responsibility for that on on the editor who's rejecting us, or the you know the publishing house, or whatever, or the society at large who doesn't appreciate our values. And um, and a while back, I started thinking that there was that, that there's this fundamental truth in publishing, which is that this is a commercial operation. Mm -hmm. They need to print X numbers of books, and they need to sell them. And so, it's a units game. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the first novel that I ever wrote, um, which was rejected along with four others, um, <laughs> that's comforting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's the other, yeah, yeah. The other thing about like writing any kind of fiction is keep going. Yeah. yeah. Um, so five five novels later, I finally get published. But um, that first novel that I sent out, the the editor was like, "I like this. I like the writing. I like a lot of things about it. It's way too dark. I can't take it." And right. You're like, oh, like I just thought if I made the best book possible, that was sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. And you know that I, you know, the fact that I checked all these boxes: good characters, good plot, good story. You know, like oh, but tonally, like I dragged them down into hell and left them there. Can I? Um, I want to pause and ask a question yeah. here because so I recently um, I'm finishing up a novel and my in my workshop, uh, one of the person was looking at the opening which has since been changed but it's a pretty dark opening mm -hmm. right um and she was sort of saying like i would put this book down it's it's just too depressing right. and it's um i needed i she wanted something that that had more potential of hope and light right. to be able to keep going right. and I, I was pretty resistant to this mm -hmm. and then i ended up coming up with something that was like oh no i actually i like this other version better than the one i'd done before but if someone says, no, I really need the dark opening or I need the whole book to be dark, I, I wonder whether, you know, whether you're willing to say, like, I'm going to indie publish this or I'm going to give it to a small press right. that's willing to take a chance on it. And I'm sort of accepting that that means I may get 50 readers and be done. Right. I, th um, I think when you're talking about those kinds of things, what we're really talking about is values of writers, basically, mm -hmm. and what you want to get out of your writing. Mm -hmm. um, so and as long as your your behaviors are aligned with what you want to get out of your writing, mm -hmm. um, then whatever you choose is right. correct, right? Yeah. I want to stay absolutely true to my vision, and I do not care about its commercial potential. I do not care whether I only get right. 10 readers, but I have been true to my vision, and that was the most important thing. Right. That's a valid artistic choice. Um, if you do that, and then you complain that like nobody loves your writing, <laughs> right. well, you know, now you're right. not aligned. And, yeah. and so that's the question is, do you want to be in... Do you want to be published in mass market? Do you want to be on the front shelves of Barnes and Noble? Do you want to like? Well, and, and if, if you, you have, do, and if you have a you message may, you're trying to get out, right? You may want to be read by more people. So right. if you do, you may want to try to figure out a way to have a conversation with these, you know, really commercial publishing houses. And so, right. going back to the idea of that first book that got rejected, it was like, oh, these guys are thinking. I need to sell, I need to know I can sell 5,000 copies right. or I need to sell 10,000 copies or whatever the thing is. And 
And, and that's the fear that the editor has where they're like, my job's on the line. Mm -hmm. So you're talking to that machine where they're right. like, I need to actually be able to make a pitch. And next year when I make another pitch, people for them to believe right. me. So, um, so recognizing that, then you start thinking like, are there, and a lot of people I feel like sort of move into these camps where it's like, you can either be true to your art or you can be a commercial sellout hack, you know, fucker. Right. <laughs> and, and those are, this is, this is all you've got. Right. And, and to me, it really was more like, okay, so these are, this is the puzzle box that we're mm -hmm. working with, which is like, I've got my values. There's the commercial space that I want to be in. If I want to like transmit my values, is there some kind of win-win? Right. Um, and you're looking for that idea that, um, that there actually is, if you're a clever monkey, you can figure out the win-win scenario. And so a lot of my early work was trying to figure out what's my clever monkey version of, of like the win-win where I get to talk about exactly the things I want and the publishing houses are like, nom, 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 nom. So you and I um, had a conversation about five or six years ago um, where uh, we had just met and I had been... I was uh, envious of the fact that in your career at that point, you'd written The Wind-Up Girl, you'd written Shipbreaker. You seem, you seem to be working in multiple genres and right. styles. And I'm someone who has like a new idea every five minutes mm -hmm. and they're, they don't all track into one easy marketing category. Right, <laughs> and I was, right. I was, I think I sort of came to you and I was like, well, how did you manage to be able to be allowed mm -hmm. to write all these different things? And what you said at the time, I think was that wind up girl was so, I don't remember anything. Well, no, this no, no, is, go so on. This yeah, is yeah, a, yeah, yeah, I know. No, no, like, I deny it all now. <laughs> that's, that's, you may not, smart, you, might not, case, you might not agree with it now or you might, but what you, one right. thing you said was that because wind up girl was so commercially successful, it ended up giving you more freedom with right. editors um, willing to take risks on some of your other work right. and giving you just more flexibility. Right. Um, and so maybe that sort of speaks to, I'm imagining that someone um, paying attention to this would be thinking, well, do I want to compromise, find the win-win? Um, maybe that win-win also makes other things possible, yes. right? Um, so. No, it's absolutely true. I think it was probably about Shipbreaker, actually, yeah, yeah. because, so. um, yeah, there was this thing where, so, let, I mean, speaking specifically about a book, so looking at something like Shipbreaker, I knew that I wanted to talk about sustainability. I knew I wanted to talk about global warming. I knew I wanted to talk about resource depletion. And, um, but, and to, I, but to teenagers too. Right. And I wanted to talk to kids about this thing. Yeah. Um, so there's my values, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's this idea. I, I flat out, like, I'll be honest, I want to earn a living too. Right. And got a family the, to support. <laughs> I, I, I like money. I don't mind it. Like I'm a fan. So like, how do I get my values and my money? Right. And, um, and so one of those answers actually was specifically to think about writing for YA. Right. Um, that was a genre choice that was mm -hmm. like, I've heard that people support themselves writing YA. People weren't supporting themselves writing science fiction. I was like, okay, well, let's try this. Like, mm -hmm. um, later on, it turned out you could do it in science fiction too, but that was a surprise. But, <laughs> um, but the thing with, um, was that, you know, then you're looking at this idea of like, okay, so what's the, you know, these are my values. But, you know, when you're thinking about a teen reader or a kid reader, it's like, what are the other things that you want to offer? And for me, that one of the things I was really interested in was reluctant readers, um, mm. readers who felt like the books weren't interesting to them or weren't exciting yeah. to them. And so I'm thinking, oh, what's the story I want to give here? Not just like what are not what my, what my message is, but what's the joy for you right. as a kid reading this? You know, yeah, my son's a reluctant reader, and um, until he encountered the Percy Jackson books, right, and he latched onto them incredibly mm -hmm. hard, mm -hmm. and he listens to the audiobooks right. over and over and over again, and it's really given him a passion for story, right, um, which is opening doors, right, right? yeah. So, and I, you know, I did the same thing when I was writing Zombie Baseball Beatdown, which is mm -hmm. a middle grade book, and yeah. I was interested in the same ideas like how do you give the gift of story and then talk about some big things mm -hmm. and and what you're looking at um in a lot of cases with something like shipbreaker um and also certainly in the adult world when i was writing something like the wind up girl i have values that i'm thinking about you know i'm concerned about resource depletion i'm concerned about global warming um the the number one thing that i see going on when you write values fiction is that um you tend to to break things into a plot structure that's going to be the good guys versus the bad guys. And the good guys are going to have the good values and the bad guys are going to have yeah. the bad values. And automatically that structures you in a didactic space where there's not a lot of room for anybody to think or enjoy the book because they already know what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes what I'll do instead is I'll try to make my environment make the, the argument about what my values are. Um, so, and this is why I end up writing a lot of dystopian or broken worlds is 
I say, okay, so if we run out of resources and we didn't plan and we sort of let the poor all go and right. we just, you know, sort of say, screw it, like, what's the future look like? And you sort of spin that out. You say, the sea levels have risen, New Orleans has been drowned, there's all these different things. And now you just get to tell a story not about, like, who has the good values and who, who has the bad values, but a story of a kid trying to survive in this world that, you know, we as adults in this present moment built. Mm-hmm. Um, and And so... You know, you don't have to have those characters say anything about, gosh, if only we'd recycled more or right, right, gee, right. if only we had, it's like, you see, right. if only we had, like, we wouldn't have given these kids this terrible, difficult life yeah. tearing apart these old oil tankers. Mm-hmm. Um, Do and, you try and offer solutions? Because I, I feel like that's sometimes where I see message fiction going awry is, and you know, right. so I think of Cory Doctorow, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, yeah. I love Cory's work in mm-hmm. many ways, um, but I, I think on occasion his his economic analyses and his he has such a, a desire to see the working class triumph, mm-hmm. right? That sometimes I feel like that interferes with his story. So, like for the end of For the Win, I found it implausible, mm-hmm. right? Um, that that all of these worker collectives ended up just triumphing over the, sorry, spoiler, um, over these massive corporations right. in a relatively easy manner. Right. And so maybe if you could talk a little about how that, like, I, I don't even know whether, I'm trying to think whether you present solutions. Really. So I, I, yeah. I, I almost do it in the same way that I do. Um, I almost do it in the same exact way that I do, uh, you know, present the problems is that those things become background objects that populate the story. Right. So one of the things I was interested in Shipbreaker was I was interested in, in renewables and, mm-hmm. and, and the opportunities for renewables. And, uh, so, you know, it's really hard actually to write like about like how cool wind turbines are in the story. <laughs> um, but, you know, wind is interesting and I was interested in like, okay, so what about, you know, a new age of sale? What if, mm-hmm. like, what if we had a new age of sale where we stopped using carbon to move goods and services around, you know, goods around the world and instead went back to sale? And we had a global economy based on sale and literally based on canvas and wooden boats. Mm-hmm. And so you then you think, OK, so what would the future be if you said we're going to use sale? So it's going to be low carbon, but it's going to use all of our technology prowess. Mm-hmm. And and so what, what would we build then? And so you end up with clipper ships with, you know, high altitude parasails or hydrofoils right. or all these things. And suddenly you're sort of talking about an inspiring technology. And I think in science fiction, this is hugely powerful stuff. Right. Like these are, you know. And this is what I've heard referred to, at least with the eco stuff, as solar punk, right? Is instead of, instead of a, a grim version, here's the hopeful, inventive, uh, ecological future. Right. right. Yeah. And so for me, like there was an opportunity to sort of pair a story about a kid who's tearing apart this ancient oil tanker and struggling to survive. But out on the water, he can see these beautiful sailing ships. Mm-hmm. And the idea is like, if I can get out there, if I can get onto those ships, my life gets better. Right. Um, and so then you can kind of encapsulate a couple of different ideas, both the, the wreckage of, of the world the unplanned and un- ill thought out world and also the opportunity of something better. Mm-hmm. And, and there's something there that like for me was really powerful. Um, and you know, but it's not necessarily like, boom, 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 we need to build more sailing ships. Right. It's like, <laughs> isn't this a cool idea? Right. Like, wouldn't these be neat? Like, what if we did more with this? Um, do you think that, I guess I'm wondering, do you see pitfalls for when people are trying, other pitfalls that we haven't discussed yet, maybe when people are trying to write message fiction, um, ways that they go awry, that um, when someone, I feel like, so for example, um, my own work has a lot to do with race and right. and, uh, and national politics. And I feel like there's a lot of like singular solutions, right? Here is a right. chosen one who is going to lead right. the people right, right, right. in a resistance battle, um, we're here in Dublin at mm-hmm. uh, Worldcon, so I've been looking at a lot of Irish postcolonial history, mm. and so the narratives often get framed as, you know, here is a set of heroes, mm-hmm. um, and I think genre is particularly susceptible to that, mm-hmm. right? Um, the the chosen one narrative, yeah. And so one thing I I prefer to see are uh, a polyphony of mm-hmm. approaches in a story where there's mm-hmm. some people who are doing a worker collective and there's right. some people who are trying to mobilize the economy in certain mm-hmm. ways. And there are some people in active politics and there's some right. people burning down the system. Right. right. And seeing how all of that together interacts. Right. And so 
I don't, I don't know if any of that sparks anything for you in terms of like your approach or other people's approaches. I, I think so. The things I think about when I'm like thinking about like trying to, you know, like, okay, I want to illustrate a bunch of approaches or something. Mm -hmm. um, so something like the water knife where I was writing about drought in the Southwest and climate change. Um, the, the, I wanted to sort of illustrate people who'd planned and people who hadn't planned. Mm -hmm. And, and so Phoenix is a devastated city where they hadn't done a lot of planning and they've really been impacted by long running droughts and stuff like that. And Las Vegas is a place that really looked around and said, oh, like bad stuff is coming. We need to start building these really highly efficient arcologies. We need to really be planning. We also need to be sort of weaponizing ourselves and going after other people's water and stuff. But they're really hard eyed and about like trying to, you know, and so you see the idea was that, you know, you're illustrating a couple of different perspectives on like how they engaged with the world. Mm -hmm. um, the way I think that relates is that you, you still can't say like, have any of these people specifically espousing their values exactly. It's far more interesting to have them be fully realized. And this is the thing, you, you really want them to be interesting characters, people with their own hopes and dreams, their own motivations. Mm -hmm. um, I have people like Catherine Case, uh, who's the, the head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. So she's the water, you know, sort of czar. Um, and, and she's a really hard-ass character. Um, and she's also, you know, I hope, um, somebody who's presented as being like, this is the world I see. I am not here to like, you know, I'm not here like to be mean. I'm here to like make sure that Las Vegas has water. Right. And... And her, you know, her portrayal and then Angel's per, per, um, portrayal as her water knife who goes out and actually blows up other people's water treatment plants. Mm -hmm. Like what motivates him to connect with this, with this woman and to work for her and to go out and, and do her dirty deeds and stuff like that. And then, and then to get to the other side of that, who are his victims right. um, and what are their perspectives and stuff like that. And the more you're like presenting people as like fully lived in people who have a reason for being the way they are, for doing the things they do, and then having them run into real conundrums with the things that they believe. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm clearly my right path, but they're challenged in some way, and their right path might be the wrong path, or their immediate path might end up having to veer. That's where story gets right. you involved, and that's where, you know, the, the reader, you know, can start living with the character instead of watching them as kind of like paperboard cutouts representing ideas. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah, I'm not sure if it was you. You might have been you who actually made the comment about Gene Wolfe. Did you? No, no, somebody else. Um, somebody. So I was talking to somebody about values mm -hmm. stuff, and if you want to make a values argument with your fiction, and this was something that Gene Wolfe had said, you'd better be able to walk pretty close to making the opposite argument as well in your fiction so right. that like you feel like that's you really argued all of the sides. Well, and it's it really, it's like, something we try and teach in like in. an English, you know, an English lit class or a composition mm -hmm. class. At, you have to um, walk the students through the counter argument thing, and mm -hmm. you're, you don't want to just set up a straw man argument right. that's easy to knock down. Right. You actually, the best essays are ones where, which take on the real serious, difficult challenges that are being posed by opposing sides, and then right. addresses them right. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, doesn't doesn't mock them, doesn't take right. them lightly, right? right. And so, um, I think this is all super helpful. I, before we wrap up, I had one sort of tangential question, which is uh, for people who are interested specifically in ecological fiction mm -hmm. um, and science fiction and fantasy in particular, uh, I had uh, read there's a set of essays that Amitav Ghosh uh, presented in okay. Germany um, that got collected into a book, and I'm blanking on the name of it, uh, fairly recently, where he was sort of making the argument that it's particularly difficult uh, he was sort of asking the question of like why are there why are there so few like great um, ecological novels mm -hmm. right um, climate change novel etc mm -hmm. and he was sort of arguing that it was particularly difficult for people to take it seriously because the scope was scope was so yeah. vast yeah, yeah, yeah. and so when when someone addressed it. And I think sci-fi community got a little um, defensive about it when this came sure. out because like, was, we write about climate change, Look right? At and and he actually like, specifically this. said like not science fiction, and people are like, right. oh, you know. But right. I think what he meant was the problem with doing it as science fiction. And I talked to him about this a little bit because I was like, oh, I was also a little defensive, and I was like, and he was like, the problem is when you do it as science fiction. Uh, a lot of people will still dismiss it as right. fiction. So if you look right. at something like Mad Max, right? right no, and, you know, no, it's that's a why I got published by Knopf. 
because like that because I wanted to be speaking to a mainstream audience. Yeah, and I wanted to have mainstream. I mean, this is yeah. more of a credibility issue right. with the, what science fiction community is. But it's one of the reasons why I targeted a mainstream publisher for my career was like I was yeah. working towards this idea that I want to be sitting with a mainstream publisher as I write science fiction that's now not quite smeared with science fiction because Knopf is putting it out instead, and that that legitimizes you and gives you know, the opening for NPR to interview you right. about these topics, sort of, you This know, is a current these. serious issue that we right, are, right. Uh, that we should be looking at now right, right, and right. not a fantasy of the future, right? right? And um, so, so I thought that was but, interesting, but, but and then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, but the other thing about it, like, is it, these are big, wide, diffuse problems, mm -hmm. like, and, and this is something that I've come up against again and again and again, where you're, like, trying to find some angle in and this is you know and in, in some cases it really is a genuine intellectual experiment to sort of narrow down how to talk about a, a complex environmental right. issue so and so I came from short fiction like mm -hmm. a lot of like my early stuff was all short fiction and it was a really good laboratory for me to make different kinds of attacks mm -hmm. on a story if I want to write, write about endocrine disruptors um, you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, artificial uh, chemicals that mimic right. hormones um, just just to define something there. Yes, I love, <laughs> um, love the definition. Yes. Um, you know, if I want to talk about that and I want to talk about something like estrogen mimics or something right. like that that are rife in our environment, how do you how do you make this a story? And, you know, what's the 3,000 word story version of it? And what's the mm. 10,000 word story version of it? And um, it was really useful for me because you started thinking about like, okay, these characters have to represent something. And then they also have to, like, the story has to represent something and the world has to represent something. And all of those things tied together are going to make the argument. And and so, you know, for example, I wrote a, a story called Small Offerings, which mm -hmm. is all about a doctor whose job is to uh, abort first babies mm -hmm. um, because the babies act as like these sort of suction cups for all of the, the the toxins in women's systems so you have the first baby and you abort it oh, wow. um and yeah. then you have your second one which is much more clean right and uh and and you know it's a very short story but it's it's so it's about her doing this work um and her also secretly getting access because she's catholic getting access to another kind of a, a chemical that also is flushing flushes mm. these things out but it's expensive because right. the marketplace makes it expensive and so it's about her values as a doctor helping these women to have clean babies right. but it's an awful process and then also her um trying to dodge it right. at the same time and and so you have this world, and the world itself is a very polluted world. Everybody's mm -hmm. wearing filter masks and stuff like that. Right. And so you never have to say, like, anything about, you know, this is good or bad. You just have to let her live with the conflicts of her life and her values in the space that she's been put. Right. Um, and then you sort of pause and look at it again. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. okay. Um, that's that's super helpful. I'm going to – I'm going to – I had one more question, and we were going yeah. to wrap up, but um, – which is just of course I chose like the most icky. No, I love it. I actually feeling, well, and, and, like, and in fact, I'm like, trying to remember like there was a so. there was a really excellent um, novel about abortion that um, worked very similarly, and I'm gonna cider house rules. Okay. Um, I think yeah, actually like, it, it worked right, in exactly the same way. Right. It it's gave an, you a doctor who was really did not want to perform abortions, but right. because it was a choice between that and letting these women die at the right. time, right? And it let you see his conflicted right. response so, so. Welcome to a complex world. Like, yeah. let's explore this. Let's be with these characters as they feel complex things. Like, right. that's worthwhile. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to wrap up with um, just if I could ask you for recommendations for other people who you think are doing interesting work specifically in the ecological science fiction um, mode. I, I know... Jeff Vandermeer takes a very different approach from you, but mm -hmm. I, I think is is really interested in many of the same issues. Right. And you see that in his work. If there's right. anybody else who you... You know, Kim Stanley Robinson is somebody I tend to point to. Um, right. I probably just because I like him and he's such a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he has been talking about this for a long time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So. No, and... Um, uh, but I am actually, I, this is embarrassing. Like this is one of the things where you like reveal my complete ignorance <laughs> is that I'm not, um, I'm not deeply read. Um, yeah. and so. Well, so it's, and it's, you know, it's very tricky when you're like enmeshed in this 
so deeply in trying to finish your own novels, trying to find the time to keep up with what everyone else is doing is not easy, right? Well, so, and frankly, I don't tend to read the things I, I, I eat. Yeah. I like to read romances, comedies, mm. things like that. I, I, the, so one of the things about writing the kind of work that I do, it's not because I enjoy it. It's because it's, I'm processing certain anxieties mm -hmm. and trying to make sense of them. Um, so I don't enjoy dystopias. I don't enjoy stories about ecological collapse. I don't enjoy right. stories about, um, how profoundly unnervingly mangled the environment is because I'm thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. So they're not the, it's not the kinds of stuff right. I seek out either. Um, uh, occasionally I'll find nonfiction stuff for research, but it's like, I'm really, I, right. I actually shield myself well, pretty that makes, actively from well, then, some of that stuff. And that so. makes a lot of sense. Um, and there's only so yeah. much of the war in Sri Lanka that I can right. take at any given point right. as well. Yeah. So I did, I did want to say something else mm -hmm. about like that of whole, course. the process of, of, of structuring your ideas mm -hmm. and like trying to layer them in. Um, and th so when I was writing the water knife, it was, you know, it's a climate change novel, right? So it's mm -hmm. a big screen thing. It's just like so big. And so that was like this process where it was like, okay, I'm going to write about climate change. And then, okay, I'm going to focus on drought. Okay, where am I going to put this? Okay, I'm going to put it in the American Southwest because it's a vulnerable area. Mm -hmm. Okay, how am I going to play with the ideas? I want to have people who plan. I want to have people who don't. What kind of characters am I going to use? Well, I'm going to have one guy. I'm going to have a water knife who goes around and blows everything up and takes water for Las Vegas. I'm going to have a journalist so that I can talk about sort of the high, you know, sort of the, the, the intellectual layer of mm -hmm. what's going on in this world. She can go and interview anybody. She can be, she can think about the larger intellectual, you know, meaning of what's kind of going on mm -hmm. as well. She can be your sort of proxy sort of narrator for describing some of the world really? and the meaning of it. Um, I wanted to have a climate refugee. I wanted to have somebody who's specifically been directly impacted. And so that's where like Maria comes from. She's been uh, taken out of Texas because it's already um, burned up and 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 dried up, mm -hmm. and and then she's made it as far as Phoenix, but she can't go any further because there are border controls everywhere. So you get to watch. This is a have not. You get someone like Angel who's fighting for the haves. Right. You start seeing with this perspectives. You start being able to live inside of the 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 direct human impacts of the mm -hmm. world. But then you want to also build the world in a way that it's illustrating again and again. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about drought. So you're looking for details that allow you to do it. And so when you're building the world, you're looking for how many times can I reinforce the idea of water scarcity? Um, I'm going to invent something like clear sacks where people who are poor pee into these plastic bags and then squeeze them to recycle their urine. And that's how they get fresh water. Whereas rich people are going to live in an arcology and it's all done very nicely. Mm -hmm. But even in that arcology, they're going to be able to see on their faucets and taps, they're going to have a water meter that's telling them how much water is being used, mm -hmm. what the cost is. So there's a price meter going. So the reader is also thinking about scarcity all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you want to have the environment itself telling, saying something. So you want to have dust storms and smoke from four forest fires kind of sweeping in and, and sort of affecting everything as the characters are going around doing their thriller plot. This is the world. And so if you do enough different pieces all together, it starts to build an almost, I guess, almost claustrophobic space mm -hmm. where you cannot stop thinking about the implications of long-term drought and climate change. And it's like all of these pieces all together. And then you're going to have a plot about water rights. Right. And, and so every single layer is functioning to say, one little piece about this much bigger idea. And that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the thing that like you're trying to do in terms of like really drawing people in and then giving them a thriller plot. So they think they're reading a thriller, but they cannot stop at any time thinking about climate change and what the implications are. So well, that's, anyways. I think that's a fabulous note to end on. So that was, that was awesome. I now think we have a roadmap okay. for how you might take that structure and apply it to all different kinds of message fiction. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so thank you. This is Paolo Bacigalupi, um, author of many books. Paolo, where can people find your work? Uh, any any independent bookstore. Um, do you, you have know. a website? Is Palo Bachiglupi? Actually, no? No, nobody can spell Palo <laughs> And so I decided a long time ago that that would be a terrible well, idea to have palobachiglupi.com would not work. It's windupstories.com. Windupstories.com. Yeah. Excellent. And this is Marianne Monroch with the Speculative Literature Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.